Let's start this chapter by understanding how search engines display results. This is going to be critical in developing the first stage of understanding how search engines work. When looking at how results are displayed, we organize the results into three different categories. The first is organic results. Organic, or what's also called natural results, are the results that come from the search engine's ranking algorithm. Why what comes out of a computer we call natural or organic? I'm really not sure, but that's the name that stuck. So organic results is what we are primarily going to be talking about in this course because that is how and where search engine optimization is applied. Right next to organic results are what we call paid advertisements or pay-per-click advertising. Those are ads that you bid money on. You are charged when people click on them, thus the term pay-per-click. And you can write the ad. You're in full control over the content of that ad. In organic, we can affect the words that are there, but we can't control it. And then there are the blended results. And we're going to spend a lot of time on blended results because based on what type of business you are, you can take a lot of advantage of blended results. Let's look at a search engine result page or a SERP, S-E-R-P, which stands for search engine results page. The first thing is we can find the ads simply by looking for the heading ads. That denotes that these are advertisements. The search engines are legally responsible to label their ads as ads. They can't make their ads and the organic results look too similar because it might fool people. And so the FTC has mandated that ads be labeled as ads. We can typically find the ads at the top of the page and also on the right-hand side of the page. Regardless of search engine, this is typical. The blended results that I referred to earlier, that shows up based on what you're searching for. This search is for New York hotels. So based on that search and the intent of the searcher, the search engine interprets that as the searcher is looking for New York hotels. So in the upper right corner, we're going to see a map with pins in the map of hotels. In the lower left-hand corner, we're going to see hotel contact information, names, addresses, phone numbers, and reviews. What we're concerned about when we talk about organic listings is that little box in the middle. And as you can see, when you start putting in blended results and ads, there's not a whole lot of space because most people will only look at the first page and maybe only the first half of the first page. So getting in those top three results that's critical to getting more visibility, and that's what we're going to be looking at. Now, also something to be aware of is when you do a branded search, the search engines show the results a little differently. So this search for the New York Hilton, what we see is what's called indented results. The brand name or the brand is the first result. However, underneath and indented is the contact information, the address, the phone number, and then also page links. These are typically the most requested or the most used pages that are on the website and then displayed as part of the search engine results. Now, organic results, they're based on the search engine algorithm. The big word here is relevancy. How relevant are these pages to the search word that the searcher typed in? So we're looking at popularity. We're also looking at proximity. Where are people in relation to what they're looking for? That gets into local search. And then also, what you do with search engine optimization is you learn the words that people are typing in, you learn what they want, and you work those words into your website, into your content, through architecture, and through links. And that's how we're going to start learning about search engine optimization. Now let's look at blended results. From the lesson before, I alluded to blended results as being very important based on what type of business you are. So let's look at blended results and see how you can take advantage of them. First of all, blended results are based primarily 
on the intention of the searcher. Based on the words searchers use, the search engines try to interpret what they are looking for. So they're looking at an information-based search. They're looking to see, is this user interested in movies, hotels, restaurants, products? So based on that type of information, they're going to change the display of the search engine results. Also, what the search engine takes into account is the searcher's location. So if you are in New York searching for products, you're going to see different things than if you were in LA searching for the same exact thing. Also, your search history plays a part in the types of results you are going to see. The search engines try to learn what you predominantly search for, and in doing so, that way, when you perform a search, they'll use your history to see what you've searched on in the past. Your search history is used by the search engines to figure out what types of results to show you as you search now. So your search history can come in and affect the results that you see that no one else will see based on your personalization. So let's look at how blended results can change. For example, this search for Statue of Liberty fireworks. You get images, you get video, and it's all based on the word that's used. So the search engine is interpreting what it is you're looking for and then provides you media that will match that. Now, if we look for a New York subway pass, based on that search, the search engine, Google, is going to show you customer assistance numbers, the address, how to get in touch with the subway authority. Also, you can figure out where you can get a metro card, you can figure out where you can get subway maps, and so all kinds of information is available to you to figure out how to use the subways in New York. You can also use this in searching for information about your favorite sports team. The Yankees are not my favorite sports team, but we're going to stay with the New York theme because if you want to know about the Yankees or any other team, you can get a quick look at the schedule. You can get an overview of the team and the players on the team, what positions they play. You can also get news for your favorite team from a multiple list of sources. Also, you can find out when your team is going to be on TV and on what channel. Maybe you're interested in buying a New York t-shirt. Simply by typing in a product such as t-shirt, you're going to get products out of Google's shopping search. Maybe you're interested in a movie that night. So if you type in New York City movies, you're going to see an ad for the latest in movies. You're also going to see what movies are playing, the ratings. You can also click and see the trailers and see the listings for movie theaters in the area, both by map and by location. When you're searching for a restaurant, Google really excels and, and the search engines are really putting a lot of emphasis on this. So just by searching for sushi in the West Loop of Chicago, I can find maps, I can find all the restaurants that are in the area, I can get addresses, phone numbers, hours that they're open, and immediate access to reviews. If I ever want to know how to do something, go to a search engine. Like I said, we live in an age where every answer that we would ever want is available through a search engine. So if you want to know how to change your oil, type in how to and what you want to do, and you can see videos or you can read about how to do it. It's up to you. I mentioned earlier that the search engines use location data. So a search for a zoo in Southern California shows San Diego Zoo as being number one. If you search for a zoo in Manhattan, you're going to get the Bronx Zoo being number one. And then personalization is going to move its way into the search results. So in looking to see what the latest is on Pinterest for business, at the bottom of the page, I see an article by a friend of mine that I am included in Google+. Plus on my network. So because he's in my network, his articles and his information influence what I see in my search results. And we're going to be seeing more and more of these personalization customizations in your search results as time goes on. So blended results, they can be video, they can be images, maps, locations, news, directions, 
movies, sports, e-commerce, local businesses can take advantage of this, public transport, travel. It's invaluable. Blended search is the search engines trying to predict what it is you want, when you want it, and enabling the search engine results page not to be a list of things to go find the answer, but the search engines are trying to make the search engine results page the source for your answer. Now, in order to learn search engine optimization, the best teacher is simply evaluating the search engine results page. Because the search engine results page is going to show you what the search engines deem as being the most vital, important information because of what it shows the searcher. We can learn from what it shows the searcher and apply that to our own websites in the first step of optimization. So what we're interested in is the term that people use. We're interested in the results and how the results are shown. Is it blended results? Can we take advantage of that? What are the other results on the page and what do we have to compete with? And then also, what is the snippet? We're gonna break down what the snippet is, but basically that's the listing for your website and there are multiple components that make that up. Then we're gonna look at the primary elements of the search result page of the snippet and figure out what we can learn and how we can apply it. So the first thing that's important to know are what words the searcher uses. We call those the search query or the keyword. The words that searchers type are the key phrases, keywords, or search queries that we're looking for. And also what we wanna know is how closely does it match the results that are on the page. You see, when someone types in something like New York hotels, the results are full of snippets. And again, the snippet is that grouping for each website result. And so what we can see here is that the keyword match of New York hotels is throughout nearly every snippet. There are some differences here and we're gonna look at that. The first difference is context. Just because someone typed in New York hotels doesn't mean that every result has to line up specifically. So we can see city in between New York and hotels. We can see it reversed with hotels in New York or just New York by itself. See that snippet is important because what we're looking at is the page title in blue, the URL is in green, and the description is the black text. Once in a while, you'll see site links underneath there. Those are in blue as well. So whatever is in blue, is clickable as a link to the website. So this is the primary basis of a snippet, the page title, the URL, and description. The page title is critical because the page title is the first marketing message that a searcher will see about your website. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can build these page titles. You can be short and sweet. So if someone types in New York hotels and that's who you wanna get and that's where you wanna rank, then you just make your page title New York hotels. Or you can make it a little longer and provide a unique sales proposition. So TripAdvisor says New York City hotels, check out 430 hotels with 220,000 reviews. So not only did they use the right keyword, but they expanded beyond there to give a sales proposition. Same thing with Expedia, compare hotels. Uh, Hilton, New York hotels, but then they say their brand name, Hilton, New York, New York. You see, there's a lot of different ways that you can construct your page title based on the brand, based on what you do, based on your type of business. But what you're doing when you add more words is you're extending the relevance and you're extending your ability to rank for different words. And so you can rank for Broadway shows or New York tours. Putting all of that into one title though, as you'll notice though, it kind of trails off and you get the ellipsis. That means that the page title wasn't going to fit. It's too long. And what I've seen that works best is that titles that are short, that encapsulate a specific thought 
or a sales proposition are the most quickly and easily read and do the best at attracting a click. So in understanding our search results, the page title is everything. It's the largest, boldest, and most easily read text on the page. The page description is that smaller black text, and we're gonna look at how we can build a marketing message into that, and the URL so that people can see what page it is. And of course, as a brand, you're really interested in those indented results and those page links to make those appear. Now, what can we learn from that? We're gonna take that and we're gonna pull it into some more understanding of search results, keyword research, and start plugging it into the page to make our snippets look great and attractive to the searcher. For this lesson, we want to understand how search engines work. It's critical in understanding this, so when you know how search engines work, you'll have a proper understanding and expectation of how quickly things will happen, how they happen, and when changes will show up in the search engines. So the first thing we need to know about how search engines work is there's a little thing called spiders. Spiders are a software program that is sent out by the search engine to find new information. Now, we also call these bots or crawlers. Again, there are some strange names in this industry, but all three of these words mean the same thing. It's a software program that the search engine uses to request pages and download them. Now, this comes as a surprise to some people, but really what the search engines do is they use a link off an existing website to find a new website. And when they find a new web page, they request a copy of that page. They download it to their server. They evaluate that page. They find links to other pages within that brand new website. And so they start requesting all these pages off the website. And one by one, they download pages off of a website until they have downloaded a complete copy of that website. And that's what the search engines use to run the ranking algorithm against, and that's what shows up in the search engine results page. So what is happening is, and this is critical to understand, the search engines need to download a copy of your website. If they can't download a copy of your website, it will not show up in the search engine results. So the first part of search engine optimization is making sure that the search engines are quote unquote seeing your website. And when we say seeing, we mean they're downloading your website. Also, what we want to be sure is that every page has its own unique address. You see, this page here denotes that this is the only place on the internet that you will see this specific page of information. A URL is a mailbox. So when you see a URL published online or you see a URL in the search results or you see a URL in your browser bar, what you are seeing is the mailbox for that document. Every document has a unique address. And so the search engines need to be able to access that address to make a copy of that page. And so we can see the process here that the search engines have to download a complete copy of your website to their servers. The searcher, when they type in a search, is processed through the search engine's database, through the ranking algorithm, and then those results come out of the database. So. Quick overview, spiders, bots, and crawlers, they make copies of your websites and of your documents. So your website needs to be readable or seeable to a search engine, and then the algorithm is applied to the documents that the search engine has downloaded to its database. The critical part here is if you have a brand new website, the most important thing you can do is start building links to the website because search engines find new websites by following links around the internet. And once they find you, they visit frequently to ensure that they have the latest, most up-to-date copy of your website.
In this lesson, we're going to talk about the search engine algorithm. I've referred to it a couple of times as we've gone through here, that the algorithm is based on relevance. Relevancy being what page is most relevant for the words that the searcher has typed in. Now that relevancy is based on a couple of things. It's based on the content of the site. It's based on the content of the page. It's based on the importance of the website. Importance is gauged by the amount of links coming from other sites to your site. Now some of this is based on the frequency with which you use the words and related words throughout your website and in the links. But it's not ultimately all about frequency. A lot of it comes down to reputation. How well is your site perceived and judged by other websites? And that comes down to links. And so the search engine algorithm is based into two primary areas. The first is what you do on page. And by that we mean how you optimize the content that is on every page of your website. You can optimize the content, you can optimize the structure or the code of the page, and you can also affect the code through the markup instructions of the code. So on your website, you are in control of the content that's on the page, you are in control of the programming, and you are in control of the code. So those things are completely under your control, and you can change those anytime you want. Now what's out of your control are links from other websites coming into your site. Those links are what search engines use to determine how trustworthy, how important, and how relevant your site is. Links are essentially third-party opinions giving a non-biased evaluation of your website. Search engines are also taking into account social signals. What is being said about your company or your website in social media and what types of links are going back to your site from social media posts, tweets, pictures, videos, and so on. So all of the intention in search engine optimization is on the algorithm. The main reason is that the algorithm changes many, many times throughout the year. And over the past, there have been about five to six major changes in about the past 10 to 12 years that have affected how search engine optimizers do their job. But really, the algorithm changes constantly throughout the year. It could change a couple of hundred times. And that's because the search engine is constantly trying to refine the results, searching for more quality. You see, the customer of the search engine is the searcher. And so the better results the searcher gets, the more that searcher is going to use that search engine. And so quality is of utmost importance to a search engine. And all these little tweaks to the algorithm are geared to improve the quality. Now, sometimes there are some accidents that are made. Sometimes sites that aren't doing anything wrong get thrown out or penalized. But there are things in place that you can get back into the index. But the problem is there are people that do create low quality or spammy sites, and that's who the search engines are trying to target. Now, the core algorithm doesn't change a whole lot. I've been doing a lot of the same techniques since about the mid 90s, and I still have sites that I haven't even touched for years that are still ranking well, because the core algorithm for your on-page rankings is still basically the same, content and keywords. Now, the reason why the algorithm changes so much when we talk about quality, a lot of times people try to create their own backlinks, their own links from other sites, by creating thousands of low quality fake websites with links to their website. The search engines have to somehow improve their quality by finding these sites and getting them out. One of the major algorithm updates that was done a few years ago is because search engine optimizers were over optimizing their websites, meaning they were using keywords too many times on the page and it was obvious that they were doing it just to get rankings and not to present a good image to the searcher. 
And so what the search engines are ultimately trying to do with the search engine algorithm is improve their quality, increase visibility of quality sites. And for your on-page optimization, what you need to know is that in three primary areas, you have control, and that is the, your internal links, the content on the page, and the structure and architecture, the organization of your website. And that's what we're going to focus on in the next few chapters. So we're going to talk about content, making quality content, unique content, how to build links that will build your reputation, and how to develop an architecture that's clear, organized, and allows the search engines to realize what your site is about and rank you for hundreds or thousands of related terms. To be an effective search engine optimizer, it's critical that you know code. Basic code, like HTML, is how web pages are built. And so the better you understand HTML, the better an optimizer you're going to be. In addition, the more you understand servers and server settings and how web pages are downloaded, how web pages are created, how they move from the server to the browser is going to be critical in making you a better search engine optimizer. Now, when I talk about HTML markup, the critical areas that we're going to need to know and that we're going to focus on in the optimization is the page title, the meta information, H1, H2, and H3, links, and alt attributes, just to name a few, but these are the primary areas that when you initially optimize a web page, these are the first areas that you look at. So I hope you're not intimidated by code because we're gonna go through and look at each one of these areas and see how they are used and what they look like in the code in order to enable you to be a better optimizer. So when we look at page structure, where we want to find most of the information that we're interested in is in the heading of the code. It's very easy to spot because it's at the top of the code page and it's preceded with head. And when you look in the heading, that's where you find the title. And the title is contained in between the two title tags. You have an opening tag and a closing tag with that forward slash that closes the tag. Now, a meta description is a description of the page. A meta keyword is a keyword list of keywords that are relevant to the content on the page. Those three areas are contained in the heading. Now, page titles are the most important thing that you can do in search engine optimization. I tell people this is about 80% of your total on-page optimization effort is the page title. Search engines are particularly interested in the page title, and we know that because that's what they show in the search engine results as the largest font, with the brightest color that's easiest to read. Because the search engines put so much emphasis on the page title in the search engine results page, we want to put emphasis on that in our optimization. Here's an example of what that looks like. The page title, when you go to the page, is at the top of the browser, and it's also in the search engine result. And when you look in the code, it's in the title bracket. And you can see that at the top of the code. Now, the black text that's in the snippet, that's the description. And that comes from the meta description. And you can see that in the code here, where it says meta name equals description, content equals, and that's where you put the content, and that's where the search engines pull that information into that snippet of information. Now, your meta description is very rarely, if ever, used as part of the ranking algorithm. The most important factor of the meta description is that it's used in the description in the search engine results page. Again, I've said this before, but your snippet is the first marketing message a searcher will see about your site. 
So the time you spend in developing a clear title and a clear description will pay off in the long run because you are attracting people to click your result when you have that visibility. Now, when we look at page structure, I talked about this earlier, the H1, the H2, and the H3, and you can even go into an H4. Really, H stands for heading. H1 is your primary headline. Think about it in terms of a newspaper. There's always one very large headline. That's our H1. There are subheadings, H2. Then there are, I like to call them paragraph headings. They're smaller. And then there are even smaller headings that are used for captions, bold text, but they're arranged in order of how large and impactful they are. So obviously, your headline is going to be the most important. Your subheadings are subcontent. They're second most important. Your third most important information are paragraph headings. And so what you want to do is think of a newspaper and how a newspaper is structured when you develop your headline, subheadings, paragraph headings, and other organizing headings in your content. The next thing you need to know is a link. This is how you code a link. Ahref means reference. When you click on this link, it goes to this page. Now, the dots there are where you can put what we call anchor text. The text that you put in between those two brackets will show up as the underlined text. And so what you're giving the browser the instructions to do is take this text and link it to another page. And so that link text is what we're really looking at because link text becomes vitally important in later lessons as we talk about optimizing and getting other websites to link to you. Now, it comes down to just basic text markup. It's fairly easy. If you understand where we're going with this HTML, these are going to be very obvious to you. You can use bold or strong. You can use italics. It's very easy to figure out most of this stuff. You can also do an unorganized list. That's what UL stands for. And when you use UL as an unorganized list, that means you are going to have bullet points. When you use organized list, that's OL, instead of bullet points, you will have numbers. And so how you use bullet points or lists, you can create those in the code and again, this is a way that allows search engines to know what is important information, what is information that's being alluded to, what's being listed. And so as you go through this course, it helps that you know HTML. If you don't know, this is the primer, but you should learn more. If you already know it, then you're ahead of the game. But most of search engine optimization when dealing with a brand new site is troubleshooting and it really helps to know what code means what and what elements are necessary. And if you want to be a great SEO with a lot of experience, it's going to require an extensive knowledge of HTML and maybe even some programming languages because you're going to have to make quick edits and know what you're talking about when you're asking other people to make changes on their website. In the earlier lesson, I made reference to knowing HTML and understanding code. This becomes critical when you're troubleshooting a website to find out why the search engines aren't downloading it or it's not showing up properly in the search engine results. There's a number of obstacles that you need to be aware of. Number one is that search engines, they can't see images. If there is text contained in an image, it can't be read by the search engine. The search engine can only read text that can be seen in the HTML code. So an image can't be read by a search engine. Your architecture is critical in providing search engines the context of the information and the navigation and the organization of your website. Also, there are server settings that can completely keep the search engines away from your website or allow them in. Knowing about them is critical. And then also, one of the things that drives SEOs up a wall is duplicate content. 
Duplicate content is frustrating, and a knowledge of code will enable you to troubleshoot why it's happening and how you can stop it. The first thing, though, is images. You see, if you design a website that's primarily image-based, the result is you're not going to have much information for the search engine to download and run against an algorithm. We see this on some of Target's older websites. It was primarily an image-based website, and as a result, there's no content. There are some people, though, that just don't want to change, and regardless of what search engines want, they refuse because they want a pretty website that's got lots of images. Now, another thing, and this gets into server settings that will stop search engines. If you'll notice, the URL in the snippet is cancer.org for the American Cancer Society. This is where the search engine believes that the home page lives. It's the address. However, when you click on American Cancer Society, where you are taken is to a brand new address. We call this a redirect. It's really like the website moved and had to leave a forwarding address. But because there is no forwarding address, Google still thinks the homepage lives at cancer.org. And so Google does not see the information that's on this new page because the user is being sent to a new address that the search engine can't find. You see, a redirect typically happens when you change a URL. That's changing a homepage location, changing a location of a page. Usually we see this when people develop a brand new website or they develop a new content management system. And so all the old page names have changed and they don't exist anymore. And so this is why when a new website goes live, the rankings completely disappear, visitors go down, and business suffers. Unless there is a plan in place to take care of these pages and direct visitors and search engines from the old page to the new page. And that's why we need to know server codes. Now, one of the ways I use server codes is I want to make sure that the requested page that I want is being delivered the right way. Also, if there's a redirect happening, that helps us understand if the page is being seen properly by the search engine. It's one of those troubleshooting tools that you absolutely need to have. I like using a software program called Webbug because I type in the page that I want. And if I see in the received data the 200 OK, that means that the search engine or web bug, which acts like a search engine, was able to find the page just fine. Now, the next address is 302 moved. This is a web page that has been moved to a new address and there's been no forwarding address left. So even though your browser might take you to the new page, the search engine is not informed of the change of address. And so it will not find the new website based on this instruction. The problem is that many sites, when they change the content management system or they redesign the site, they use 302 redirects, which don't direct the search engine at all. And so you lose your traffic, you lose your visibility, and you lose the visitors to your website. Now, the problem comes when we find duplicate content. As I said before, every page has its own address. The problem comes when one page can be found with multiple addresses, meaning that there's multiple mailboxes for one address. And so when there's more than one version of a website, this is usually caused by the content management system that's not installed properly, or it just wasn't ever built to run this way in consideration of search engines. And sometimes this can happen by accident when you're trying to manage a secure site and links get out of your control. An example of this is the Brookstone homepage that when you go to the homepage, you're at brookstone.com. But if you go shopping through the site and then you go back to the homepage again, you'll see that there's a brand new address. To a search engine, this is a brand new page with a new address, but it's the same exact page as the home page. It's seen as two separate pages, not one, in two separate locations, 
and that becomes a problem. We see this also with a couple of products. So you can see for the first page here, it has Brookstone in the title. We can see the address, the URL of that product. And we can also see the menu where it's in outdoor living and barbecue. However, the same product is available somewhere else on the website. The URL is different, the title is different, the navigation is different, but it's the same exact product. Because of this, how does a search engine know which is the best page to send people for rankings? As a result, another website is probably going to be favored because it was easier to determine which is the best page for the search. Now the difference with HTTP and HTTPS. HTTP is the typical protocol that we see in front of most web addresses. However, when you're on a secure site doing shopping or putting in any personal information or credit card information, that goes into a secure site for the server. Now, this also comes about when you start getting, I think, a little lazy in your linking. You see, an absolute link has that HTTP protocol, the website, and the page that's being linked to. A lazy way of linking is called a relative link. And in doing that, all you're doing is saying, we're assuming, since we're already on this domain, that we don't have to type in the entire domain, we just have to type in the page that you're gonna go to. Now the problem is, when you are in a secure page, shopping, and you decide to click on a home page or a navigation element, and they use a relative link instead of an absolute link, it will duplicate the entire website in an HTTPS rather than just HTTP. I know this might get a little complicated, but hang with me. Here's what it looks like. In front, we have sunburstcoffee.com. In the back, we have HTTPS sunburstcoffee.com. To a search engine, those are two different pages. Now to you and me, it's the same page. We can figure it out. But to the search engine, remember, every page has a mailbox. And what we're seeing here is we have a duplicated page going to two different places. And so part of search engine optimization is managing the duplicated content, the content management systems, and the obstacles that we come across when we are developing and optimizing websites. So take into consideration the images that you use, the architecture of the site, and the duplicate content that can happen. It's not an adversarial relationship with the search engines. Reality is that they're doing everything they can to help webmasters understand how they work and how they can improve their websites in order to do the best that they can in search engines. And so they give us some tests and they give us some tools that we can use for friendliness. We can do a couple of quick tests on the search engines themselves, but then what the search engines give us are webmaster tools. Through webmaster tools, we can ensure that our websites are being downloaded and also find and spot any potential problems. The great thing is, is they are constantly improving the webmaster tools in the feedback and interaction between the search engines and website owners and managers. One of the tests for friendliness you can do is just go to Google or Bing and type into the search box site colon and the website. You see, if you type that in for Expedia, what you do is you get a list of nearly a million results from Expedia. This quick search lets you know if the search engine has data in its database for that website. It's a real quick test. It's one of those that you can just do to make sure that a website is being seen. Beyond that, it's always a great idea to enroll your website in Webmaster Tools so that you can have access to the data that the search engines have. Now, both Bing, Microsoft, and Google have great Webmaster Tools, and there's some other software that we're gonna be getting into further down in the course. Bing has some great information when you log in so that you can see and ensure that your pages are being crawled by the search engine, and it will also notify you of any crawl errors that it may have encountered. 
It will also let you know how many clicks you received from search, how many times you appeared in search results, uh, any crawl errors, index errors, things like that. And you can also get some ranking reports as well. I don't put a lot of stock in the ranking reports that the search engines give me individually, but sometimes it's really good data to know, and you can also see the trend of have your rankings stayed, have they improved, have they dropped. You can also get, and this is through Bing, they will give you helps and advice on which pages need attention. So it will give you very specific suggestions how important the suggestion is and how many times that error or suggestion could be used on your website. So this is great information from Bing that helps you be a better SEO. Google does the same thing. It lets you know how many times your site has shown up in search results and also how well your site is being crawled and if there are any crawl errors. You can see at which day how many crawl sessions have been made and how many pages have been downloaded. So it's great information to know when you want to ensure that your site is being seen by the search engines. So again, it's timely, it's up to date, and it's direct from the search engine, and you can make sure that your content is being crawled from the search engines directly, which helps you do your job much better.